deeper. I, it's okay. I forgot to record the prayer. It's all right. It's all, it's all right. I'm always, I get excited and I forget things. So pray for me. Amen. Amen. So <clears throat> today, um, we're going to, I'm going to go before you and we're going to uh, read the, um, we're going into the book of Philippians. And, um, and I said to you earlier before that, you know, I'm a work in progress. And the title of this message, if I had to title it, you guys know I do not like the title. It's just a work in progress. And it's in um, the book of Philippians. And I, 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 and the reason for that this message, um, I, I pray and ask the Lord to guide me through this message is because of the fact that a lot of times, I think we misuse the idea of a work in progress, especially when it comes to us as believers. Um, <clears throat> so when I was studying, I had to look up, you know, I like definitions. So I had to look up what is the definition of a work in progress? So of course it says the, the, the Webster, the Miriam says that a work in progress is when you, it says, this phrase is used, it's a phrase that is used. And this phrase is used when a project begins and the work is continuing and still being developed or added to. So it is not complete. So then the project is not yet finished. So that is the phrase, a work in progress. But as believers, we are a work in progress because when salvation comes to us, there is a process that goes and the process is salvation or what we call justification and then is sanctification. And we talked about that a little while back till we meet Christ in glorification. Amen. So it is, we are continuing a work in progress. We have not gotten there yet. And I think Sister Eve always used that term. We are not there yet. No, we are not, okay? And we will not until we meet our savior, amen? So we are a work in progress. But the reason why I, I talk about this is because of the fact that we use this in a negative, we, so many of us use this in a negative sense. And, and or I, I call it a negative tone. Um, and we use it, and, and when I looked even for that, and they said, well, if you're like behind, you know how you got a project you got to do, and you're behind, so you say, oh, it's a work in progress. Or if you had work, and, and you know, and, 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 and you've got reports to turn in, but all your reports are not completed, it is a work in progress. Me, when I am baking and I start, I already know what the finish is going to be but I have to start the process. And the pro as I go through the process, it is a work in, pro in, in progress, right? But this is how we use it. We use it says, I'm only human. I am a work in progress. The Lord is still working through me. Um, I'm not there yet, okay? Um, God is not through with me. You know, all of that is so true, but when you use it in a negative tone, then you've just taken God totally out of it. And it is all about you now. So the work in progress is you trying to get where you need to go. God has nothing to do with it. So do not use him in that aspect because a work in progress the Bible says that he who has began it, he is faithful to complete it. So if that is the case, then if he began it, there is no fault, there is no failure in him. So then that means that whatever he's doing through you, he's doing it righteously, he's doing it faithfully, he's doing it justly. So then there is nothing negative about it. So that's why... I went, you know, the Lord took me into this first book of Corinthians. Uh, and and um, and, I mean, not Corinthians, Philippians. That's what I said to you guys before. So, um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> that's why he took me there. 
So that idea that, you know, I'm only human, be patient, God is, yes, please be patient. God is dealing with me in a positive way. Forget that I'm only human because that's the flesh. Get it out of there. Say that I am walking the spiritual walk and God is dealing with me. Amen. Let's change the whole mindset. Let's, let, let's, let, let's get out of this spiritual mind, this negative, I mean, this fleshly mindset that we go into so much. And when we use the flesh so much, it puts us in a negative tone. And, and to stay positive, we, are a, we serve a spiritual God. We are spiritual people, yes, walking in a fleshly world. But again, we are not of this world, amen? Because we are spiritual people following a spiritual God. Okay, so <clears throat> um, a work in progress that we are, and he says that we are his masterpiece. Amen. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are um, his masterpiece created in him for the good things that he has planned for us. And he planned this thing long ago. It's not something he just picked up today or yesterday. He planned it long ago. Amen. Before the foundation of the earth. So if you go with me <clears throat> to first. I mean, to Philippians, first chapter, I'm right there. And I'm only going to read six verses, um, but I'm really, my focus is going to be on verse six. Uh, um, it's hard for me because I'm so used to reading a whole chapter to you and going through it. So pray with me and pray for me as I deal with this one verse and not try to be very repetitive. But um, it is, it is, it is um, where he's leading me. Okay, so let us go. I'm in, and I'm using the ESV um, book today. Um, and I may some, uh, sometimes go and use the NLT um, if I have something to say that I want you guys to, to hear it a little, uh, in, a, in a more simpler term. Okay, so here you go. Paul and Timothy, <clears throat> beginning with the first verse. If you dare raise your hand, give me a thumbs up. I'll make sure you all there. Okay, great. Philippians. Okay. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. So I'm not talking to nobody but to us today. Amen. It says to all the saints. Okay, so we know who talk Paul is talking to. And he also includes the overseers or the leaders of the church, as well as the deacons. So nobody is exempt. This is everybody, okay? And then he says, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is normally Paul's introduction in most of all his books. He always um, introduces us that way. And he always come thanking God you know, and praying for his people. And he says, and I thank God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my very, in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For well, I am confident in this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. So Paul is thanking God in his prayer. He is rejoicing and thanking God for the Philippians because the Philippians are the people that he, if you guys remember in the book of Acts, in the 16th chapter in the book of Acts, Paul went to Philippi. He was, he was on his way somewhere and he said he got a vision of a being called in Macedonia, if you could remember that, okay? Macedonia, Philipp, Philippi is in Macedonia, okay? Paul got a vision of a man calling, say, hey, we need your help come and see about us in Macedonia. So him and Timothy um, decided to go that route because if you go with me, I will take you there and show it to you. 
um, in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. And this is where his the ministry in Philippi started, is in this 16th chapter of the book of Acts. And um, so Paul is, <clears throat> he says that he is doing this. He has them in his prayer. He is offering a prayer for them with joy in view of your participation. In view, that word participation mean in view, and some of you, your words may say fellowship. And in some of your Bibles may say partnership. In some of your Bible, it may even say preaching. It may even say teaching. So Paul is saying, hey, listen, I'm praying and I'm, I'm rejoicing of this relationship that we have here, okay? So in the 16th chapter, if you, be, if you begin with the sixth verse, you'll see what I'm talking about. I'm, that's what I'm gonna begin with, okay? So it says, next Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Then coming to the borders of Mysia, they, in, they headed north for the province of Bithynia, but began, but again, the spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. And I'm reading in the NLT, somehow I just jumped to that NLT, I don't know why. So instead they went on through Mysia to the seaport of Tros. That night, Paul had a vision, a man from Macedonia in Northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God calling us to preach the good news there. So we boarded to, at a boat at Tros and sailed straight across to the island of Semitrace. And the next day we landed at ne Neapolis. From there, we reached Philippi, a major city of that district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. And we stayed there several days just as I had explained to you guys. And then on the Sabbath, we went a little way out side of the city to a riverbank where we thought people would be meeting for prayer and sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Thyretia, a merchant of expense, expensive purple cloth who worshiped God. As she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. She and her household were baptized and she asked us to be her guests. So do you see that? What caught me in the very beginning was, oh wow, she was a woman if you because it says she was a woman who worshiped, right? And I was like, James, do you see that? You know, uh, because if you ask somebody and, and you say, well, what does that word worship mean? You know, a lot of people would say that we're, you know, worshiping God, we're reverencing the Lord, you know, and, you know, and, you know, and, and, and automatically somebody that worship is someone who, knows of God. But yet, right in the very next verse, it says that the Lord opened her heart for her to receive the message that Paul was preaching. So then that tells me automatically that although this woman may have heard about God and she might have kind of reverence or had from whatever she heard, she adored and she liked what she was hearing. So she began to reverence God. And you know, this is God in work. This is God at work in us, you know, that he prepares us for what it is that he has for us, right? And yeah, doesn't mean that we're saved because as you can see, she was not, I didn't say the word saved. 
he prepared her for what she was about to receive. And Paul ministered to her right there. And the Bible says that she received, that he opened her heart and that she received the gospel right then and there, her and her family. Which tells me if you go back to Philippians, for, um, and also, as you guys know, if you continue on this chapter, and I know you guys and I'm not, um, you know that the jailer, him and his whole family got saved right out of this same chapter right here. This is all in Philippi. So when Paul is talking to the Philippians, he's not only talking to Lydia and the jailers, but everybody else who they helped to bring in, you know, who they ministered to and was saved. Amen. So I'm just showing you that Paul had, uh, uh, you know, he had ministered to these people in Philippi. And then that's why he says, in view of your participation, in view of our relationship, in view in the teachings that those in Philippi continue to do, as you know, they're ministering to the people out there. He says that he is praying for them joyfully in view of their participation in the gospel from the first day until now, the day that they received Christ, you know, that, you know, that the Lord saved them, that God himself, salvation came to them through God and God alone, not a work that they've done on their own. And this is what I mean by when I say that as believers, yes, we are a work in progress, but it is not a work that we are doing ourselves. It is the work that God is doing in us and through us. Amen. So that we can see that because he goes on and he says, in view of this from the first day, and then he says the word for I am confident. That means I am assured. I am absolutely convinced. I am persuaded. I trust that God is doing this. I believe that God has saved you. Listen, salvation comes only through God and God alone. And it is a work of God. And if God has begun the work of salvation through you, right there he says, for he who begins the good work, that means a profitable work a work that he has started, that work will not, there is, there is no hiccup in it, not a work of God. So that idea that we use this in a negative tone, that's a no-no. As believers, throw it out the window. Throw it out the window because the work that God is doing in you, it is the truth of the word. And, and so if you go with me and I'm going to show you, the Bible says that he chose us in him, in him. Who is him? He, God, Yahuwah, chose us in him, Christ, Yeshua, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. We would be holy. There is no way you could have salvation and not holiness because he is a holy God who saves you. We have a holy God. So if we're not following the things, if he says that he has, he has called us to be holy and blameless, righteous. Christ died on a cross, which justifies us, redeems us. We were lost. I was looking this morning and the Bible says none. Romans 1, Romans 1, read it. None, none seeks after him. None understands him. None. So it is nothing that we would do ourselves to go looking for him. The Bible says that we took the truth of the word, and I'm still in Romans 1. We took the truth of what he has shown us that he himself is able to do. 
what he has done. We took the truth of God and we turned it to, into a lie. And then what we've done is we have suppressed it. You know, when I was reading that thing this morning, I said, oh my goodness. You know, we've taken this thing, we've suppressed it so hard that we cannot see the truth. that it took Christ and Christ alone, that it took God and God alone to allow us to see who he is. In our own, I promise you, you will never see him. If salvation is not yours, and I am talking to the believer today, so those that, the believer knows who he is. You know who he is, and it is the Holy Spirit who is directing us to him. It is a work that he is doing through us and he is doing this work and this work alone. The Bible says that it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his goodness. So it is nothing that I have done that you have done is not, is nothing that you've been such a good girl or a good boy or good man. And that he says, you know what, since they've been so good, I'm gonna go ahead and save them. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And you know what's so good about it? He didn't even wait for you to be born. He thought about this before you were even born. He chose you before you were even born so that you have nothing, nothing today to say, oh, he did this because he thought, no, he thought of you before you even existed. So that you cannot, uh, how you say it, um, how you say it, you can't boast about nothing. You know, so that's why today, whatever it is that you have, it says that it is God who works in you both to will. And I looked up that will, both for his purpose. That's the will, for his purpose, not yours, and to work. The work is to be a effective, to be active for him. He does this for his good. So all we could do is thank him and say, Lord, thank you that you thought about me. Prayerfully, you thought about a whole lot of us. But I am so thankful that you thought about me. Don't take this thing so lightly. Don't take your salvation so lightly that we use the word, you know, I'm only human. He's still working in me. Yes, he is still working in you. And guess what? The work that he's doing in you, it is in faith. And guess what? There is no faith without repentance. You need to repent every time you come up short. Repent, turn, and then move in faith. That is the work of sanctification. You know that. That is sanctification. It is a work that continues throughout the whole process. That's why you are a work in progress. Paul says that he is confident, he is persuaded that the good work, the noble work that God has started, the work of salvation, it is only the work of God. And that work comes in from salvation through sanctification that leads us to Christ and glorification. That's why he says um, it will perfect it. That means he will complete it. So then that means what he started, he does, he completes it. He says he's going to perfect it. He completes it. So if he started the work in you, if you say, if I say, if we all say that we are believers and I am a believer, and I know that I am, I don't know about you. And you got to know this thing for yourself. Okay. And that's why I open my eyes the way that I do. You got to know this thing for yourself. And I know that I am. Amen. You got, and, and the word tells you that. And I think I told you guys before, read 1 John. For those of you who have not, read 1 John, especially that fifth chapter. That fifth chapter of 1 John tells you how you know you are. If you have a hiccup, you got a hit. Don't let the enemy in because he's in there trying to tell you that you're not. He's a liar. 
and the truth ain't in him. And that's how he tries. He tries. Do you hear what I said? He tries. Because if you are a child of the king, Christ says, everyone that he has given to me, I have yet to lose one. So the enemy is lying. If you think you lost, you're wrong. If he called you and you have accepted that call, then you fully commit obedience. And you fully commit then there is no way that the enemy can tell you that you are not a child of God. Christ said that the ones who I have called, who are following me, he said that the Lord has given to me. He said, Father, I have not lost one. Not one. So don't let the enemy lie to you. God has begun a good work. Yes, he has. He has begun a righteous work. He tells you the truth. And I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you something. Go with me right in the second chapter. Lord knows I hope I can see because I'm crying and over here and I can't even see when I'm crying. And listen, and, 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 and um, he says it like this. I want you to see this. Oh, no, it's, in, it's, it's not in here. It's in um, Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians. Oh, God, thank you. It's in 2 Thessalonians, and I want you to see this because the enemy is a liar. You see? No, it's in Philippians. I'm sorry. Go back. In the back of Philippians 27 chapter. I want you to see this. 27 chapter. I want you to see this. I want you to see this why he lies to you. He says, and I'm reading, um, this, is, this is what um, Paul is saying. He says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But I am to live on the flesh, on in the flesh. And I'm reading this because I want you to see what Paul is saying. This will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose. But I am hard pressed from both direction, having the desire to depart and to be with Christ. For that is very much yet. Oh, no, wait a minute. Uh, it's 27. I'm reading the wrong thing. He says, only right here, please forgive me. Only can I told y'all I can't see when I'm crying. First Philipp is Philippians, first chapter. I'm in the 27th verse. I told you I can't see when I'm crying. I jumped all the way to 24. Oh, okay. He says, only conduct. That's what I'm saying to you. Conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come to see you or remain absent. I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. It's 28 that I want you to see. He said, in no way alarmed by your opponent. Do you see that? Which is a sign of destruction to them, but of salvation to you. Do you understand that? If you walk worthy of your calling, if you walk according, if you allow God to work out the good work that he started in you, and do not give the enemy any kind of way, what it is is destruction for the enemy, but salvation for you, and this is what Paul is saying. Whether I am before you or I am away from you, continue to do the good work. Continue to allow the work of God to complete in you because it is destruction for the enemy. But if the enemy got you fooled, then it is destruction for you and it is an up on him, okay? And let me explain something to you. What God has called, he said he is faithful to complete it. So if the enemy is working in your life, I believe you need to go back and start praying and asking God to give you salvation. I don't say it, the word says it. Because there's no way, there is no way, and I'm going to say it again, there is no way that salvation is yours, but yet you're walking according to the word. There is no way possible. There is no way possible. 
And, and, and what I'm saying to you guys today, this is basic. We are talking about back to basic. This is, this is the word of God. This is salvation. And this is from the beginning. I'm only reading what Paul has says here. So he continues on and he says, for to you, it has been granted. Did you, did, did you hear that word? For to you, and I'm at 29, it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in Christ, but also to suffer for his sake. So when things come up against you, honey, plead the blood of Jesus on it and ask your God to strengthen you. And he says, just as I have suffered, you will suffer also. Right there, it just tells you that it's been granted that not only will you, not only will salvation be yours, but that you're going to suffer with him too. It just says that right there. He literally says you have to suffer. And you know what? I, I thought, I always, in my own mind, I always thought that the word suffer means that, you know, some detrimental, you know, you know, something coming at you. But I'm going to tell you something. Last night I was talking to my daughter and suffering is, the Bible says, and, and I'm going to make it plain and simple to you. The Bible says that the God of this age has blinded the disbelievers. Okay? He's blinded the disbelievers so that they cannot see the truth of the word of God. Understand that. And because of that, when you are rearing your children or when you are walking in this according to the word of God, and if you read it and you walk according to it, the world is in disagreement with you always. They are in disagreement with you because they cannot see what the spirit is saying to you. Because to them, the things of the spirit is foolish. It is not real. So you are always going to clash. There is always going to be a disagreement because they cannot see what this word is saying. When you say it to them, it is no good because we, the world, not we, because I'm excluding us out of it. The world has conditioned its own to live a certain way. So when we come with the truth of the word of God and we say, wait a minute, Yes, we have been conditioned. And I think ever since I came to Kingdom Covenant Ministries, the Lord has dealt with me and has taken me through a whole new different walk. My walk has changed 360 because I was reared one way. But then the Lord showed me, amen, through this word, that everything that I had been taught by others that I had been following, it was not his word and that we need to follow the word and not man. Don't follow them, don't follow them. Please y'all don't follow me. If I'm not following Christ, don't follow me. Amen, it's just what Paul said to his people. And this is what he's saying to everyone. Follow me as I follow. Christ. Don't follow Pastor Dave. Don't follow Pastor Ed, Ed. Don't don't follow them. Don't follow the elders. Please don't follow the brother James. Don't follow Sister Eva. Don't follow none of those elders. Don't follow no members of of, of, of Kingdom Company if they're not following Christ. You follow the Word. You follow this Word, and I guarantee you. It will not, you will not come short of following it. Matter of fact, the world will not have anything to do with you. 
because of the fact that they cannot agree to this. And I promise you, because we're so conditioned to a certain thing. They are so conditioned. We are, I, I'm telling you, people are so conditioned that when you say, but listen, I'm rearing my children according to the word of God. And this is what the word of God says. And I want to show, they will sit there and they will have the biggest argument with you. And they will try to get you to believe them. But you stick with that word. You stick with him. He says, because what he has started in you, he is faithful to complete it. It will not be completed until Christ return. You got to understand that. So as long as you are walking in the flesh, you are going to suffer. Because when he returns, we ain't being, we ain't going to be in this place no more. Not this one. What? So, Okay, so I'm telling you guys. All right, oh, let me continue because I haven't. Okay, okay, okay. So I read that. Now, persuaded from the beginning that he chose us. And this is without man's doing. Without man's doing. So stop putting ourselves in it. Stop putting yourself. In it. Don't put yourself. In it. Don't put yourself in it. Please don't put yourself in it. Yes, I am a work in progress and he is working through me. And believe me, every day I'm learning. I'm learning more and more every day. And I just took you through that. Conduct yourselves. Conduct yourselves. Amen. Conduct yourselves. I wanted to read something to you, and I, I just don't remember it. Uh, we've been studying the book of, I've been in the book of Peter, and that's what I'm studying now with my daughter and my son-in-law. And, and, and when, when, when I was reading that thing about suffering, I was like, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, this suffering is a little bit too deep for me. Okay, but it says this, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. That is 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, the 14th verse. It says, if you are reviled. So listen, the suffering that you're going through is not a suffering that you have put yourself through. Now, I ain't talking about that kind of suffering. Now, you done messed around and got yourself in trouble, then you suffer that one, okay? Because you did something that was outside. That, that's your suffering. That is not suffering for Christ's sake. I'm talking about suffering for the sake of the gospel, okay? And that's what this says. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rest on you. And I think it was Paul who says something about suffering in this lifetime for the glory that you're going to receive is going to be nothing in comparison to what this suffering is. And, 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 and this is for Christ's sake. So salvation through sanctification, salvation through sanctification, the two work in hand, repentance and faith, the two work hand in hand. We cannot, I was reading, so you can't see somebody's salvation. You just can't see it. <laughs> but you can see that sanctification, okay? Because you can see how someone is walking. You don't know if a person is saved, but you can see if they're walking right. And when they walking right, you know they say. Okay, and that is so, I was like, what? The, the evidence of sanctification, you'll see it. You'll see it because it's, it's a person who's walking just like, the Bible says we don't know what it will be in the end, but we know that we will be like him. So in our walk, it is walking as him, like him. You understand? You're not there yet because you are a work in progress. But in you, he is guiding you to be just like him. So others will be able to see. Accepting the call means that God invites us to receive him. Accepting the call. You've been called, you've been justified, you've been glorified, you've been called. Accepting the call means 
that he invites us to receive him. And when we do that, then he demands. Did I say that? Let me say that word again. Demand. Demand. Absolute. Absolute. He demands absolute lordship over our lives. Did y'all hear what I said? Demands absolute lordship over our lives. He does. He does. He's faithful. Those who he call, he is faithful to complete it. In salvation, if you guys remember Romans 1 and 16 says, uh, you know what, the older I get, it seems like I'll be forgetting things, but please, that's why I have a Bible for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. It is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. It is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. So it is the power of God that begins this, this word. It is the power of God that saves you, and it is the power of God that will keep you. Amen. It is his power. It is only God that keeps us. It is not we ourselves. So go with me, Romans 8. So if it is the power of God that keeps us throughout this walk, this sanctification walk, if we look at Romans 8, <clears throat> 29, and, 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 and I'm getting there. I promise you I'm getting there. I'll be there. 8, 29. Um, I didn't do a whole lot of reading. Eight and twenty-nine. Why am I in Corinthians? I should be in Romans. Okay, my book is so small. My 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 ESV book is small. You know, they write the thing so small. I got to put it out. That's why I'm telling you. And then here I am over here trying to cry, and then you crying and can't even see the word. I need one of the big Bibles and big big letters. Okay, twenty-nine. He says, I'm going to go to 28. And we know that God calls all things to work together for the good of those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. And I think I said that just a little bit ago, right? That in our sanctification walk, he is conforming us. He is changing us to be like Christ. Okay, conform to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn, and he was talking about Christ, so that Christ would be the firstborn among many brothers. So that's why we are brothers to him. And these whom he predestined, and I said that he called you before, before you were even born, the foundation of the world. I'm, I'm just reading what the word says. And these whom he predestined, he also called. So he predestined you before you were even born. And now that you were born, he calls you, okay? And these whom he called, he also justified. That's where salvation came in at, okay? And these whom he justified, he also glorified. So there's no mistake. If salvation, if you are called, there is no hiccup in it. There's no problem. Okay, it's not like he thought about you in the middle and said, oops, I'm gonna have a problem with Josette. Okay, uh-uh, I, I, I ain't gonna call her no more. I ain't calling her no more because I'm gonna have a problem with her. Uh-uh, <laughs> uh-uh, for the foundation of the world, he already knew what was gonna happen in this life. Okay, so, all right, and did I finish? No, I did not. Okay, now I'm jumping, I'm jumping y'all. I'm not gonna go, I'm gonna go to 35. I want you to read this. So I ended at 30. I say he called, he also, whom he called, he also justified and whom he justified, he also glorified. 
So then in 35, he says, so if he's done that, then he says, then who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or fa famine or nakedness or perils or swords? And then, so I just said a little while ago that nothing that he's granted us that we would also suffer. So right here, if none of this can separate us, then suffering can't separate us either. Did you see that? Because all of this is suffering, right? Because Paul says, what can separate us? Will tribulation, okay? Distress, Lord knows sometimes we stressed out. Especially those of y'all who still work and Lord knows I was stressed out at that job. <laughs> I ain't stressed out no more, but that job was stressing me out. Okay. That can't even, that can't even separate you from the love of Christ. Okay. I don't care how bad them evil people in that job is. And a lot of times we ain't call them evil. We say them devils is at us today. Okay. I don't care how much they running at you. That ain't even going to separate you. Now, persecution, how many of them? okay was setting you up for failure persecution that is not even going to okay now famine sometimes we starving okay and what i'm talking about is hard you know you know okay life is hard but god will make a way okay that won't even nakedness all right And I'm going to tell you, the reason why these things cannot is because he has made a way for you. And I'm going to tell you, there's too many of us here that is on this Zoom, that if somebody is going through something and we are one, we are of one mind and one spirit. There's no way if this is the evil starving and Lord knows I got so much stuff in this cabinet that I don't even use half the time that I can't pick something out this cabinet and give it to him. Okay. And if there's nakedness, I tell y'all the truth. There's some clothes here that I had to give to the goodwill. I don't have to give them to the goodwill. I could have gave them to you if you needed it. You understand that's nakedness because there is a way, there is a way. And I believe that brother uh, Elder Stanley, Pastor Stanley was talking about God making a provision. So what do you think the provision is? We are here for one another. So there is no way possible. Do you see this? Do you see how salvation works for every one of us? There is no way possible that any of these things can cause you to falter. That is the work of the enemy. Amen. Don't let the enemy get in the way. Okay, last one is I'm jumping from 35. So I read 35. So we know that none of this can separate us. And Paul, here he go again. For I am persuaded. I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor death, nor any other created, nor any other created. I must say it again, nor any other created things will be able to separate us from the life of a spiritual, not created, the almighty, the infinite, the I am that I am can separate me from God. It is what it is. Amen. So if you want to allow the enemy to separate you, then obviously you have not been called. It is what it is. And that is just a simple message of salvation. 
And I'm just really passionate about this here. So that's why I say it the way that I say it. And I'm not saying it to be mean. Believe me when I say this. God loves us. And God has called us only for his good. Think about this. Only for his good. If he thought about each and every one of us for his good, Good. You need to grab a hold of that thing and hold on to it as the very precious gold that it is to you. Because at the end, when every bit of it is being tested by fire, that is the only thing that will survive. None of this thing in this world is offering you every one of them. You can't take it with you. I don't know how many times we have to see this. Everybody die in this natural world and none of it. You can't take none of it. None of it. None. Not one. But you're going to meet him. I promise you, you will meet him. And if, if, if you guys, Bible study, we've been studying it. Right? In the last days, the day of judgment, the day of the Lord. Amen. Okay, but let me continue. Let me continue. Oh, my goodness. Okay, okay, I got a minute. Okay. All that the Father has given me, and I told you guys this. He says that. That's John 6, 37 and 39. All that the Father has given me, I have not lost one. And I told you that. He says he will raise us until the last day. He says, so we need to keep our eyes fixed on Christ. And that's what I, all I've been saying. That's all I've been saying to you guys. Please stay, stay focused. Stay focused on the Lord. And don't let the enemy, don't let the things that this world is offering. There's a lot of things going on in this world. Gosh, there's a lot of things going on in this world. And you know what? When I'm reading this thing and I'm thinking, oh, we shouldn't even pay attention. If you guys pay attention to what is going on today, it has already happened. You know what? I can take this back to, 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 to the old scriptures. If you look at what is going on today, you can go back to these old scriptures. Fornication, sexual permiss sexual whatever. This is all that was happening back then. It's coming. It's coming to fruition. It, it's just going around in circles. Will it go around in circles? Okay. It's going around in circles. It's just coming back. For your time. For just for your time, amen? And I'm telling you, pay attention to it. Do not, do not be mindful of the things of this world. And teach our children not to accept the things of this world. Do not accept the things of this world. It will destroy you. Okay, let me continue. So again, the day of Christ. Okay, so I just talked about the day of the Lord, which is judgment, you know, and then I was reading, okay, uh, if you go back to Philippians, you guys, Philippians 1, because I'm closing it out, I just wanted to just talk about, I talked about everything, I talked about the good things that he's doing for us. I just wanted to touch on this day of Christ that he says when Christ returned, and we all know that, but I just wanted you to see, this thing was pretty cool to me. Uh, he will complete us. He will perfect us. He says, so he who has begun good work, and we talked about that, it in you will perfect it. He will bring it to pass. He'll complete it. And and if, if, if you don't believe me, you go to, um, which one? Which one did I have? Which one did I have? And I'm going to tell it to you. Look at it in in um, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 24, because it says, he who is faithful to call you, he is also faithful to bring it to pass. Okay? So that just tells you right there, he's going to complete it. Uh, the day of Jesus Christ is a positive. 1 Corinthians 1, 7 and 8. 1 Corinthians 1, 7 and 8. I want you to see this. I want you to see this. And this is talking about, and this is where Paul is talking about rejoicing. I'm just going to take you through the do these things so that you can see that this is a positive end. This is when Christ returned. This is not about judgment, but this is about him returning 
and calling you. That's why Paul says this thing I'm going to show you in the end. First Corinthians 1, 7 and 8. He says, so that you who are lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. You who are lacking, waiting eagerly of the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Waiting eagerly at the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're not talking about judgment now. We're talking about the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who will also confirm you to the end blameless he's going to confirm you at the revelation be blameless in the day of our lord jesus christ not the day of the lord but the day of our lord jesus christ okay that's seven and eight now go back second corinthians 1 14 i want you to see this i had to find them in these um so that you also can see it with me second corinthians 1 and 14. I'm moving a little fast because I'm at 12 o'clock. Okay. It says, um, 2 Corinthians 1 and 14. He says, just as you also partially did understand us, that we are your reason to be proud as you also are ours in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying, those of us who I am ministering to, which is us today, he looks forward to that day of our Lord Jesus Christ, where we, that the work that he done in this and through, you know, that he ministered to us, that it is not in vain. Amen. He says that you, look at it, just as you also partially did understand us, that we are your reason to be proud also as you are our reason to be proud on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that is not a day of judgment. First Corinthians 5 and 5, look at that. I want you to see it. And it says, now, he who prepared us for this very purpose is, no, 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 five and, did I stop? I'm in second Corinthians, first Corinthians, I was already there, five and five. It says this, um, I just saw these and I just, I just put them all down for you. I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Do you see that? So that his spirit may be saved on the day of our Lord, Jesus Christ. I want you to go to Philippians, the second chapter, and that's just what I'm gonna end it with, two and 16. And I want to show you something that Paul says. This is what he says to the Philippians regarding him. He says this, he says, holding fast the word of life, hold fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ, I will have reason to glory that I did not run this race in vain and that I did not toil in vain. Do you see that? So Paul here, he just reminds us to hold fast, hold fast to this thing here. So that, you know, when, when, when I was reading this and, and Paul giving these messages to the Philippians and he's doing this to the, you know, Ephesians and he's doing this to the Corinthians and to the Romans and all of this, but he's doing this to, to us too, because these are messages that we're reading ourselves. So he's speaking to us as well. So he says, hold fast to this word. Please hold fast to this word. So that on the day of Christ, and when we are all standing before him, did he know that this toiling that he's done, you know, that it was not in vain and that this walk that we've done, it is not in vain. And God will finish. I promise you, God will finish the work in he, that he started. So don't be confused. Please don't be confused that what God is doing in our lives. 
Don't be confused of what he's doing in our life. Do not switch role and put him on the back burner and then take control. That's what you do when you begin to say, um, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing the best I can. He's not done with me yet. Just give him the glory. Just give it all to him. Yes, I am a work in progress. He, was, he is working in me and through me. I give him glory for what he's doing in me and through me. I'm not going to use that God is not through with me yet because of the fact that I realized I came up short on something. Uh -uh. That's an escape goat. Just repent. That's all. I said all of this to you today just to say, just repent. And don't say, God is not through with me yet. Just repent and say, Lord, please forgive me because I've wrong. Because the wrong that you do is not before me. It is before him. Because you can fool me every day. You, we can fool, I can pull a flim flam on you any day and every day. But you can't do it before him. So just repent. And don't use that as an excuse. Because we're wrong. Because what you're saying, when you use it as an excuse, you're saying that God wasn't right from the beginning and he ain't going to be right at the end. That's just bottom line. Amen? Okay. So, I am good. Um, I pray that you guys understood. I know that you guys understood. <laughs> Amen. I give him all glory. <laughs> all right, let us bow our head. Heavenly gracious Father, Lord, I just want to thank you. Father, I thank you. I come to you repenting. Repenting that if, Lord, I have ever used you as a reason for doing wrong, I am so wrong. And I ask you to forgive me for that. And I pray for forgiveness for everyone that is standing before you today that has done that as well. Lord, we just ask you to search our hearts, Father, and remove anything that is not of you because we know that you are a righteous God. We know that you are sovereign and that you are just. We know that you are merciful and you are a God of love. So we just ask that you forgive us, Lord, because we know that your word says that you have started a good work, a noble work in us because you have called us and you made no mistake in your calling and that those you have called, you have justified. And Father, those you have justified, God, you have sanctified. And those that you have sanctified, Father, you will glorify in the day of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we know that you have made no mistake. And that you are faithful to complete everything that you have started. So, Father, we just say thank you. Thank you for the call. Thank you for loving us, for doing it for your will. So we glorify you today. We exalt you. We lift you up so that we may draw closer and closer to you. Continue to order our step. Lead us in a path of righteousness for your sake and yours alone. Father, we thank you, we bless you, we honor you, we glorify you. In Jesus' most precious name, amen, amen, amen. God is good.
Ooh, 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 ooh.